I'm Tom Rowland, and this is the Tom Rowland Podcast. Hey, everybody, welcome to the podcast today. We've got a great guest, Derek DeYoung. He's a renowned artist in the marine community, and uh, his stuff's everywhere. Everything from trout to salt water to uh, some abstract stuff, he is on fire. And really, I see him as being the top artist in the marine industry right now. Anyway, I like his stuff. And guess what? He came down to film an episode of Saltwater Experience with us, and he's super cool. Like, really super cool. And he's not just an artist. He's a fisherman. He's down in Big Pine living right now. He's got his own huge red fisher right out his back door. He goes out there. I guess he fishes with some friends occasionally, but he loves to fish by himself. And I know what it's like to fish in the Florida Keys by yourself. It's really super hard. Super hard to learn the water and super hard to uh, not run aground and can be very frustrating. So I have really high respect for anybody that's willing to give that a try on their own because I know how difficult that can be. And uh, that's Derek. But we're going to talk to Derek here in just a minute. I want to give you a little bit of news. We are still getting a lot of ratings and reviews on iTunes, and I really thank you for that. Some of you have said some incredibly nice things, and I appreciate it. And some of you are enjoying these podcasts and these interviews way more than I thought you would. So thank you. And I'm so glad to hear that you're enjoying them. If you could just take a second, go to iTunes and drop a rating and a review. It's going to really help. It'll also help if you share this on social media. Just grab the link, drop it into your Facebook page, your Twitter feed, or your Instagram. If you like the episode, that would be amazing. Tell somebody about it, and we will be able to offer more and more and more of these. Uh, It's just plugging along, really having fun with it. So uh, I hope you're enjoying the guests. If you are, I love to hear it on the iTunes reviews. If you have other guests, send me an email, podcast at Saltwater Experience, and I'll read that, and I'll do my best to track that guy down and girl down, someone who is interesting in the fishing, hunting, outdoor world, or as you've seen with somebody like uh, like Tim Crockett, the guy's rowing across the, uh, the ocean in a 20-foot boat. I thought that one was pretty cool. Some other people have really enjoyed that one. So I don't know. It doesn't have to be fishing, but it, it helps if it's in the outdoor space. So send me your uh, send me your suggestions, and we'll see what we can do. Also, we have a new website, saltwaterexperience.com. That is the hub of everything that we're doing right now, and you can find out all the new stuff that's out there, whether it's a podcast, a weekly show, a new television show, a new episode on Waypoint, new article, new photos, whatever it is. Whatever we got new, it's on saltwaterexperience.com. And it's right now we've changed the format and it's real easy to find all our new stuff. So go there, check it out, and uh, let me know what you think. All right. This episode is going to be brought to you again this week by Waypoint TV. Waypoint TV is a place where you can go and stream the very best in the outdoor television space and short film space. 60 different producers with over 2,000 episodes and growing. You can go there and get it for free on your Roku, your iPad, your phone, your tablet, your computer, Apple TV, on and on and on. Just about any device you have, you can get Waypoint TV. Go to waypointtv.com and find out how. All right, Derek DeYoung. We went down, uh, we had late tides Rich, Rich really liked the tides in the afternoon, so we chose to go fishing from 2 o'clock until past dark. So we chose to use the morning to drive down to Big Pine and get our interview with Derek, Derek D. Young. He's got a makeshift studio underneath his house in Big Pine. He paints, pretty much goes fishing every day, uh, paints in the afternoons outside. He's an outside person. He loves being outside, and we got to see him do some really cool stuff. He did this acrylic pour, ended up giving it to me, which was very nice of him, and I just thought it was a super cool piece of artwork. But Derek has uh, all kinds of stuff going on, and I had lots of questions for him. 
because uh, I just see his stuff everywhere. I want to know how it happened because he kind of burst on on the scene for me. I know he's been doing this uh, for a long time, but like like so many people, it seems like a overnight success 20 years in the making. I wanted to find out how it was going. So uh, we fished all day, had kind of a tough day actually, but Derek took it in stride because this guy's a fisherman. He really, he really fishes and he really knows what's up. He spent nine years in Montana and he spent uh, six years in the Florida Keys and he's going back up to Northern Michigan. Guess what he's gonna do up there? He's gonna fish pretty much every day. So I figure anybody that spends that much time out in Montana and that much time in the Florida Keys is probably going to turn into a fast friend. And I was right. I really like Derek. And I think you're really going to like him too. I have a lot of questions for him. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to an incredible artist and an incredible dude, Derek D. Young. Okay, so we're live. Hi, Derek. Hey, what's going on, Tom? I'm doing great. So if you're with us right now, I've got my new friend, Derek DeYoung, uh, artist extraordinaire. We have just finished up an extraordinary shoot, extraordinarily difficult yeah. shoot we in the Florida hard Keys. For him. Mm -hmm. We really did. We worked really hard. And the reason that I wanted to have Derek both on Saltwater Experience and on the podcast is because I've admired your art. And, uh, Thanks, man. I think that not only have you done a really remarkably good job of what you do and, and your, your style and your, your painting and stuff, but you're also doing an incredibly good job of selling it and marketing it. And like, I, like we were talking about earlier, my son is a, is an aspiring artist of many different types. Maybe yeah. it's video, maybe it's, maybe it's uh, studio art, kind of something like what you've got going on, but I'm trying to encourage that. And I'm trying to, uh, to explain to him that, you know, knowing how to market yourself is probably as important in a lot of ways as, as being a great artist. So how, how have you done that? I mean, I wish there was just a simple equation I could tell you and, and have you pass it on to him, but it's, it's just putting yourself out there, you know, every day and, uh, and then just following your heart as far as your work's concerned. And, and that's really what's so rewarding. I think that at the end of the day, people see that your heart is in it and you love what you're doing and that kind of gets them interested. But, you know, you got to, you got to get out there, get, I, I went to, uh, oh, as many art shows as I could my first couple of years, uh, after I started my business, you know, it was tough. There was really not a living to be made. I don't know how these kind of summer art fair yeah. artists make it because that is a lot of work and there's not very much money in it but well, are they are they trying to make it or are they following a passion or are they just kind of hoping well you know i mean it's our passion but we still gotta you know pay a mortgage yeah and, and try to have a normal life as much as possible so for me i realized pretty quickly this wasn't the path to uh success i needed to switch this up and that's what when you say this you mean like the summer art fairs yeah, and... yep just doing juried art fairs and things like that it was a great time in my life. The first two years after art school, uh, we just, you know, w that's what we did. Traveled around the state of Michigan during the summer, set up a 10 by 10 booth, put all my paintings up. And it was so fun and interactive to chat with people about my artwork. I mean, there's nothing better as an artist to be able to sit and talk to people about your work. Cause yeah. you've got so much of yourself invested in each painting yeah. you know so much thought has gone into it i mean not to be overly deep about it but you know that's part of you on that canvas so it is really rewarding to be at shows and talking to people about your work but you know i had i figured out quickly i needed to do something more and push it in a different direction and that's when i started to realize that there was probably a good possibility that that I could get a little more commercial with my work. And had you seen examples of that or, or you just kind of, you know, I, I just had faith that my more graphic contemporary look to my art would work well on products. Yeah. I didn't know how to get in touch with the right companies, but I, I, I can remember sitting and talking to Janelle and saying, 
someday my stuff's going to be all over the place. Yeah. H- how to do that? I don't know. So just kind of kept pushing forward. What was the first time that, that, that kind of came true for you and you saw that work into reality? Well, at a certain point we, uh, decided we need to move out West. I went and did a series of art shows out West. Actually. Um, this was such a cool trip. Um, my father-in-law sold me a minivan for $1. Oh, this sounds great. And I packed it full of fishing, camping, and art gear. And I headed from Michigan to Colorado. My brother, Matt, rode out with me and flew home from Denver. We spent a long weekend in Rocky Mountain National Park. Nice. And then uh, I went around. I'd scheduled doing these one-man art shows at different lodges and fly shops in, like, kind of big fly fish towns. Mm Mm-hmm. But you had all that scheduled before you went? Yeah, I just okay. looked online, uh, Fly Shop, Colorado. Like, hey, George Anderson, do yeah. you mind if I drop in with all my art? Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, after uh, probably the first couple of weeks out there doing shows, I was absolutely hooked. I mean, the fishing was awesome. The scenery is just, I mean, to sit there and fish dry flies and look up and see these right. mountains looming over you the and all the wildlife. Cool. The people are awesome. I mean, the people out West are there because they love it. Yeah. And that, that really does make people pleasant. I think so. (laughs) You know, (laughs) I've lived in places where people aren't very happy and, uh, you know, so by the end of the trip, I'd fully made the decision for Janelle and I, uh, that we were going to move out to Livingston, Montana. And what's Janelle's situation at that point? At that point, she's working for a greeting cards company back in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where her and I both went to art school. And that's where we met. And she had a good steady job. And she's a very hardworking, responsible person. So to just quit her job, pick up and move out west was a scary thought. Yeah. In fact, I for anybody, I, I flew her out to Bozeman. And brought her out to breakfast and told her my idea. This is what we're going to do. And she just laid her head down on the table and just started crying. <laughs> because she, she knew that this was really what was going to happen. And, oh, and she man. just like, I mean, the idea of Montana, if you haven't been there, um, is probably that it's just this desolate, like, middle of Alaska. Yeah. But it's not. You know, it's no. really got a ton of charm. And I think it offers quite a bit, although eventually what it offered ran out for her and she wanted to be back in Michigan. So, but, (laughs) but when, when you're first proposing this idea, had she spent any time out, out West? None. None. No, she'd never been out there. So it does seem like a desolate wasteland. Yeah. And once she got out there and we, we went for a float on the Yellowstone river and I mean, so you took her out there in the summer. Yeah. Good move. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I had no idea what it was going to be like in the winter. And that was even shocking for me. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in Michigan. We got a good winter. Montana is cruel. It's cold and it is so windy. It goes uh, up to three weeks with 50 plus mile an hour winds. You can't even get out of your truck without letting go of your door because it's going to just, you know, hyperextend the hinge. Take it off. Yeah. So... The winter gets long, for sure. Yeah. And so so you, you stayed out there for how long? We were out in Montana just about nine years. Yeah. So nine years, and that's full-time? Or are you, are you coming to visit the Keys part, well, part of the year? So one of my... I'm, I'm the dreamer in our relationship. So I, I propose all the dreams for us to achieve, and Janelle makes them happen. Yeah. So I'm super lucky that I have a person that can, you know, execute on things. But I've always got all these ideas. And my idea is that we were going to split time between Montana and the Keys. Two, two of, in my opinion, the best places on the planet. Yeah, agreed. And she always kind of liked the idea of the Keys. But again, she was working a nine to five corporate job. And uh, I just kept saying, like, you've got to quit your job and just start working for us. And it was always such a scary proposition for her. Eventually, um, I started a second company where we produce products with my artwork on it. And that's called DeYoung Studio. 
And I told her that she had two years. I'd build the company up for two years. She'd help me after working on the weekends. And then she needed to quit her job and take that position over. Uh, after I think eight months, I said, I'm shutting the doors on this thing because I can't handle it. It's just growing way too fast or you have to quit right now. And she just, she knew she had no choice. She quit. And, uh, I instantly, there was just so much opportunity with that business. And, um, it, you know, that business takes more work than anything I've ever done, but it's really rewarding. It really is. We have to wear so many hats running De Young Studio because we're having to source products being, you know, yeah. being made, and and we've got a, you know, very high quality level to what we're making. Yeah. So there's no, no tchotchke items in the whole catalog. It's all nice stuff. So we we get samples. We use them. We give them to friends and family and have them use them hard. If it's glassware, we throw it through the dishwasher 200 times. And if it survives that, that's when we move forward next year. Yeah. So this, this uh, the Young Studios, is different than when a company licenses your artwork Absolutely, to because we own the Young Studios. Okay. And we have full control over what products we make. I actually choose what artwork I put on it. So I can put my most relevant mm -hmm. new artwork on yeah on those products versus let's say Sims who I've worked with for many years now. And that's been a great thing. Um, but they may choose something I did nine years ago. Oh, okay. And just cause it fits their plan or, you know, what they mm -hmm. want to sell right then. So it's nice to have that control. Yeah. And, uh, and it also creates a job for Janelle and, and, and we started that business and now it's been six years that we've been spending the winter down in the Keys. Wow. So it, it's it been um, an and awesome so, thing. So, you know, we were talking earlier, and I find that it's it's very interesting that you're not just spending the winter in the Keys and in the summers in Montana just because they're beautiful places and, and you like that, but it's really about, uh, or as much about, you know, getting to know these fish and the surroundings and the environment and, and, and becoming more more at home with those fish and then being able to paint them the way that you do right well if i tried to present it as a good business move that would just be a total lie <laughs> i love fishing i everyone in my family like generations deep fishes and you know that's kind of first and foremost on my mind i want to fish i want to catch fish the artistic inspiration comes kind of afterwards, but you know, you can't really think that much about doing a painting when you're fighting a big tarpon, like, uh, happened tonight. Yeah. I'm not planning a painting of that fish. I'm trying to beat them up and get them to the boat. Sure. Sure. But, but, but in hindsight, I mean, I don't know if this is how you do it or not, but like, I'll think about that fish that, that we caught tonight all day tomorrow mm -hmm. and, and weeks after. And, and I'll, uh, in my mind, I will have a snapshot of something for, for what happened tonight. Just, just to let everybody know that's listening to this. We basically fished all day and didn't catch anything until the sun went down right. I mean, the sun had just crested the horizon and, uh, I mean, I'm thinking it's time to go and we look up and, uh, the mullet's going nuts and this fish just absolutely crashes it and well, kills it. And that's, that's my picture of that fish is when the thing did that cartwheeling deal. That's what I would, if yeah, I were, if you did, were to ask me to, you know, think of one, one frame out of the whole deal, that's what I would remember. Yeah. It's funny how the mind works and what you kind of pick out as that freeze mm -hmm. frame of your day. But Tom, you and Rich both were telling me how much fun uh, putting a mullet on the surface behind the boat and having tarpon <laughs> crash on it. And I hadn't done that. Yeah. You know, you guys kind of built it up and, and then it wasn't happening. <laughs> and I'm like, oh man, I really did want to see a tarpon just crush this mullet right on the surface. Yeah. And, and that last minute, last second buzzer beater tarpon, I felt the, the, um, I was holding the rod 
and felt the mullet go crazy. And I knew for sure there was a fish chasing him. And then bam, just went tight. And yeah. the fish jumped and splashed. And then it was, I mean, he then went into bulldog mode and just yeah. fought me like a Goliath group. Yeah. No more jumping. Yeah. Well, he just, he wanted to, uh, you know, as you're down here and you have guests at your house tonight, and you're going to entertain them tomorrow and you're taking them fishing and it's, it's so funny and, and kind of a weird situation for somebody who's a fishing guide or somebody who's entertaining someone. And you think about these situations, like you're saying, we, we built up this mullet because a tarpon eating a mullet is one of the best bites in all of fishing. And if you haven't done it and all you've done is fly fish for them, well, you should see a tarpon eat a mullet because it is, it is pretty awesome. Completely different. It's, it's, it's amazing. Then when you have someone, you bring them on the boat and and you have this situation and you want to show them that situation, man, is it, is it just gut wrenching when so that situation is not to happening? Fruition, yeah. Right. Like, I mean, all of a sudden I'm realizing, man, we're running out of time. This is not happening. I don't know what we're going to do because, because the story of the show is really good. And I know a lot of people are going to enjoy it that, you know, you're, you're an interesting character. You're an artist. People are, are aware of your art. And now all we got to do is, is the fish just need to behave a little bit. <laughs> Yeah. which they were not doing that. But, uh, you know, that's the, that's the thing about fishing is that it's always, you, you really don't know. I mean, we like to think we know, but you really don't know what's going on. With I the, think with we the put fish and the all the odds in our favor. There were fish everywhere. And, you know, the, the weeks and days preceding this, we caught fish. You yeah. caught fish. Yeah, yeah. I Everybody's fish catching fish. Big it's, pines it's been fantastic. Today looked better and looked like it was going to happen. And we were in the right spot where they had been feeding. And I don't know. The fish had a mind of their own. Yeah. Yeah. They had a mind of their own. And they, they always do. And sometimes you look like a hero and sometimes you look like a zero. And <laughs> we were mostly looking like zeros for, for most of the day. But it, but it, it, it worked out. And I'm sure it's going to, I'm sure we'll be able to put something nice together. But I enjoyed talking with you today about so many different things. And, and I, I really think that, um, that the art and the fact that my son is, is interested in art, and I kind of see, I, I'm trying to encourage that because as we were talking about, I, I think that everyone needs ways that they can express themselves. And I think art is a, is a great way, well, a, not just a singular way, but one of the many ways that you can express yourself and kind of get in touch with that creative part of yourself. And so I, I find it really cool that you've figured out not only a way to make a living with your art, but also make a living doing exactly the thing that you also like to do, which is to fish. And so what I wanted to ask you is about, you know, and we, we kind of touched on it just a minute ago, but I'm sure that there was a moment where, and maybe it's that time when you were talking about, well, man, I'm going to have to change some things up here, or maybe it's a different moment, but there's a moment when you decide you're burning the boats, you're cashing in all your chips. <laughs> this is, this is it and make it or break it. Do you have that moment? You know, I haven't had that moment recently, but, but building up to this, to where I'm at now, there's been some difficult moments Yeah, for sure. Oh, I'll tell you one, when I was um, back in my days of doing the summer art fairs, my father-in-law, John, who's a investor and just, you know, he's a very intelligent guy and wants to kind of look at numbers with me, make sure that I'm doing a responsible thing here with his daughter. <laughs> and he's like, Derek, oh, he just takes a pen and a piece of paper. Okay. What's your average painting go for? Oh, well, it's, you know, 600 bucks. Okay. 600 bucks. And what else are you selling? Prints? Yeah. What do those go for? Okay. 50 bucks each. And how many do you sell per show? Well, on average, maybe eight. Okay, eight. And how many shows are you doing? When he got done <laughs> doing this, he came out with that I could make about $12,000 per year. Uh -huh. I'm like, oh, holy shit. I really got to <laughs> think about this. <laughs> but, you know, my mind, I would never have broken down those numbers like that. Right. It was sobering. Yeah. Sobering. Did it help you to say, okay, well, I've got to figure you know, out. That, I mean, I think that's way. the difference <laughs> in a way between successful people and people who kind of just flounder. He is successful and he did that. And it caused me to 
change the way I was doing things. But probably my own nature, I would have just continued on and been like, wait, why don't we ever have any money? Yeah, well, there there's definitely there are definitely people that do that and there's definitely people that that get plenty of good advice and continue on a, a, a road. It's a different person that that looks at that and doesn't see it as someone discouraging them from their no, dream. No, no, no. And, and sees it as, wow, well, let he's me, right. I let, need to change a few things. Let me give you an example because uh, my father-in-law has definitely been a great supporter. He's a creative and, and passionate guy and has encouraged me to no end in my career. And I give him so much credit. He uh, took his CPA, a longtime friend of the family, and had us meet with him probably eight, 10 times to teach us how to run our business. And this yes. was when our business, it's almost a joke to call it a business at that point. But we learned how to run it correctly. And he's assisted us and been a part of running our business all the way till now. Yeah, And it's been a huge advantage for us to so what do, do things learn? right. What do, what do you learn when you're a young person moving into that situation? What, well, what are you learning in those those little here's uh, how it, meetings? Here's how it went. We'd go over to the CPA's house and his wife would be cooking dinner and he'd start serving wine and my ADD would kick in before he even started talking. And I don't really remember anything, but Janelle <laughs> sat there next to me and actually took notes and listened and would kind of fill me in later. So, yeah, I was super lucky that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, we're we're very we're very um, alike in that way, or in this way that I will tell you. Uh, we both married good women. Yes, absolutely. And behind every good man is a good woman. And uh, it sounds like I enjoyed meeting her today. And it just sounds like she has just been. She, you you and her are perfect together. You know, it it really is a. Uh, an amazing story. And I'm so glad it's the story of my life and my marriage, but to meet someone at art school and to start an art business after art school and learn together how to run it and get better at it over time and, and be able to utilize both of our skill sets. Yeah. That's really, you know, really gratifying. I mean, she knows that she's what makes this thing run. And I know that it's up to me to, you know, and my creativity and my artwork to, uh, you know, make everything look great. So we're both really inspired. Yeah. To well, do that's what awesome. We do. I mean, that, that honestly, that's what I kept noticing. I mean, I'm, I've got kind of a, I try to have a business mind and I try to look at something and, and, and as, as I see your artwork, keep popping up and keep popping up. And now you're, now you're with a different company, a different company. Um, <laughs> or not with a different company, but another company is using licensing your stuff, my work, licensing yeah. your work, or I'm seeing more of your products. I'm noticing, wow, this guy is doing an exceptionally good job of marketing his, his skills. And as I learn, it's not just you, it's, it's you and Janelle that, that are doing it. And that, and Absolutely. that makes a lot of sense. You know, she's, she's there for every meeting and, you know, together we're able to deal with what needs to be done. And yeah. It's, we're maybe not great at each part of this business, but one of us will step up every time and do well, that's it. That's cool. So now you're, you're, you've changed your, your life a little bit again. You're no longer in Montana. You moved back to uh, Northern Michigan, right? Yep. And you're still going to come visit the Keys. So now you're splitting time between a place that gets snowy and cold and a place that is wonderful and nice in the in the some in the winter time, right? I'll tell you, we we come down here to the Keys right after Christmas, and there's just enough winter that has happened at that point in northern Michigan that I'm so happy and thankful to be yeah. in the Keys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm an outdoor dog. I cannot stand to sit inside. My average day in the Keys, I wake up, take a cup of coffee downstairs, start looking at my artwork and deciding what I need to do. I'm out there all day unless I have to go inside and help Janelle with a project. And how many days a week do you fish? Um, if the fishing's good and the wind's down, I'll fish every day. That's just kind of part of what I do. Um, but I don't fish like 12 hour days. I'll, I'll get up an hour before light and, um, go out and hit the sun sunrise fishing and, uh, be back by, 
ten thirty or eleven and get on calls and handle what I need to handle and then get painting. So I'm pretty uh, one dimensional, I guess two dimensional. I like fishing and I like painting and I do both every day. Yeah. <laughs> well, you that's that's someone who's who, in my opinion, has designed a life. You have you have created a life that uh, that that is exactly what you want. Kudos to you for doing it. It's awesome. Um, so I tell this story sometimes to people, and I think I might have told it on the podcast. But I find that um, in a lot of ways, when when people ask me, "You were a fishing guide, and then now you have a TV show that sounds like a pretty cool life. Like how how in the world do you make that happen?" And you know, I was pretty lucky. A lot of things happened at the right time. When I first started guiding, it was a little bit before River Runs Through It came out. And then, uh, and then as soon as that movie came out, I mean, there were so many people out West wanting to fly fish that pretty much anybody could be full at that, at that point. And then did a, did a fair job with those people. And, and uh, as I transitioned to the Florida Keys, did you have um, your uh, shadow casting down at that point? <laughs> well, you know what? That's a that's a common question back then. Can you show me how to shadow cast? Uh, no, I can't. It was about perfect timing. And as I came down here to the Keys and started my business down here, a lot of those trout people had kind of were ready to transition to the saltwater as well. So I came down here and had kind of a full full deal. But but one of the things that uh, that I find interesting when I look in in hindsight is. When I came to the Keys, I didn't know anything about these fish down here. I did. I had never seen a bonefish. Uh, I had caught a tarpon before, but very few. And so I had glaring weaknesses, absolute glaring weaknesses. And and you were guiding immediately? No, no, no. I spent a year on the water learning before <laughs> before I ever took a guided I'm sitting trip. Here thinking, wow, no, you had no, great clients. No, you. it was it was it was not like that at all. I I spent every single day on the water and okay. uh, and tried to learn, and and I was probably making a little bit of progress, um, but in my mind, I was making no progress, and uh, and that went on for many years, and as as uh, I would find some fish, my goal was to move on and find other fish and move on and move on and move on. And so uh, if I got into a congested area where there were other guides, yeah. I would just leave and go somewhere else and, and try to find fish. And so the point of this story is that at some point I realized that my weakness, which was I felt like I had no experience, actually in turn and in time, turned out to be my greatest strength because I never was content. You weren't weren't complacent. Yeah. And and I had no idea. I also had no idea what all these other people knew or didn't know. And so I just kept going for 10 years, like at that pace of always trying to find something. And I just wonder if you, if you have anything like that in your you know, do you, do you ever see the theme of weakness turns into strength in the way that you've been able to, uh, to create this life and your business that you have? I absolutely think that's the case with me. What was your Uh, weakness that turns out to be a strength? Well, I mean, with our business, I'm the worst perfectionist and everything has to be right. And I mean, to a degree that most people would be like, come on, seriously, like it's not (laughs) that big a deal, but it is to me. And, uh, you know, once I step back or the next day I can kind of see, well, maybe I should have let that one slide, but no, I've got to have it all perfect. And I have, so is that a weakness or is that a strength? I, well, I mean, it can probably be pretty annoying to my wife, but I have some sense that like, if anything, any colors wrong, any different, you know, on the hat, if the signature is the wrong color, that, that, you know, I just can't let that slide, but I'm the same way with my artwork. I'm super particular about how things are done. Um, I'll give you an example. We're putting out a new line of hats and, um, all the signatures were like the same color. They weren't, uh, you know, color dropped from the artwork of, of each particular hat. Right. And, uh, when I wanted them redone, we had to kind of go back four steps to get the, you know, file back and redo it. Cause they were already 
at the uh, manufacturer of the hat. And I'm like, no, no, pull them back. Stop production. Don't do it. We need to change this. And Janelle kind of gave me a look and I'm like, do you know that like with my paintings, I'd say half the time I sign it, wipe it off and sign it a different color because I just can't stand like the color that I chose first. So it's just, it's the same, same mindset. I got to see it. And if it looks right, move forward. If it doesn't redo it. Yeah. And so, so I'm still trying to determine whether that's a weakness or a strength. Well, you know, first of all, it's it's a strength because you want it all to be perfect. It's a, it's a strength because I truly do care that much. And, um, and that leads to my stuff, I think looking right. And it's a weakness because it's just truly annoying probably to other people <laughs> yeah. who are involved in the process. I've got a, a quick story about when I was in art school and I, I've talked to my wife, Janelle, about this so many times because our majors were just so different. She was in multimedia editing and graphic design and I was in uh, illustration and I did well in, in school and kind of thought that I, I had, uh, I don't know, a good position there. But I, I had this one professor and I had to turn in a sketchbook and you had to be sketching for whatever, an hour a night. I was doing more than that. I always did far more than what was asked of me when I was in school. So I thought when he saw my sketchbook, yeah, he was just going to like stand up and be <laughs> like, class, come take a look at Derek's sketchbook. This is what I want of you. I mean, I was so sure of it. Because I felt like the sketches were good. There was much more than an hour per night in there. He opened it up and I hadn't dated every sketch and there weren't descriptions of my ideas. Essentially, I didn't show the math, you know. I just did the drawings. He closed it right back up, threw it across his desk. It fell on the floor and stuff fell out of it. And he goes, don't ever turn anything like this into me again. And if you're going to go out and and try to be an artist in the real world, good luck. And I was so shocked. But the the funny thing is, is that's the exact treatment that makes me work harder. Like if you, if you tell me like, yeah, do not even show me this. I'm like, okay, let's go. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to do so much better. Well, that's but, what, that's well, kind of what happened to you when you told me the story uh, on the interview for the show today about going to your first art show, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm failure motivated. So in your first art show, let's just recap that real quick. You go there, you you feel like well, uh, first uh, first experience, first taste of uh, defeat was uh, there's a MUCC, which is the Michigan United Conservation Club. They hold an annual um, youth wildlife art competition, and shoot, I was I was a big deal and you know, my neck of the woods, I thought for sure I was going to win this art competition. And, and, uh, I entered a, a pencil drawing of a walleye that my dad had caught and was mounted on our wall in the basement. And I, man, I had all kinds of detail in there and little minnows and stuff. And, and, uh, we went to Lansing to go to the actual art show and in the exhibit and to see, you know, the blue ribbon on my artwork, except when we got there, uh, there was not even an honorable mention on it. And it was the most sobering moment, oh, I think, of my life. Like, holy cow, I'm really not as good as I think I am. On the drive home, we were all kind of sulking. Even my parents kind of were shocked that I didn't win. My dad kind of turns around and looks at me. And he's like, well, maybe it's time you start taking art lessons. And he was right. That was the right thing to say at that very moment because I took my disappointment and motivated me to, to start taking weekly art lessons. Yeah. And at that point, you know, my brain was just a sponge. So I was working under a, a local artist who had a, a good name for himself in the area and, um, taught me all the basics and everything I needed to know. I mean, I knew more in sixth grade than most of the, you know, art students, just from the school system new in 12th grade. I mean, I'd already done it all. So it was just such an advantage and gave me such confidence as I moved forward. Now, what a difference that is that your, your, your dad chose to say that, like, right. maybe it's time you take some art lessons. He's still being 
he's still being supportive and he's still, you know, trying to help, but he's also kind of hitting you with, with reality there. What a difference that is from someone else saying, well, those judges just don't know what they're talking about. Right. You know, like how would that, how would think, that have affected you if, if that was the advice at that point, you know, a, a helicopter parent saying, well, if he said those judges don't know what they're talking about, that would mean he was like saying that for me, that's not my dad. My dad's going to say what he thinks about any situation. And, and if, you know, and he's going to be truthful with you. And, and sometimes that's hard to hear, but it, it actually, you know, I appreciate it. Yeah. But those are the kind of people that you need in your life are the people that are going to, that are going to tell you how it is. And they're going to tell you in a way that it's, that it's motivating rather than, rather than, uh, you know, it could, at that moment, it could destroy you. I mean, that's a, that's a very, yeah, it was a critical moment, critical moment. It really was. And, um, yeah, I meant, shoot, it, it was, it's crazy to think back about, uh, an early childhood thing affecting your entire life, but it did. It, it absolutely does. I mean, I can, I can think of many different turning points in my life for many different things that, uh, you know, it's, it's a few minutes of your, of your life that, that really make a huge difference in, in the direction that you choose to take it and how hard you work at those things and whether or not you're going to be successful or not. I mean, there's, there's tons of those moments. And the funny thing is, is we never know when those moments are as a parent. I never know when those moments are that I'm doing that with my kids and just hoping that I'm not taking it the other way. You know, you're just, as a parent, you're just kind of hoping that you're doing it right. But being, I don't know, I guess if, if you're just being aware that any one of these moments could mean something really profound or it could really destroy somebody's confidence. So you just have to be careful. I I think that, you know, you're, maybe you put too much pressure or people do as a parent to say the right thing in that moment, because I think it all comes together. You know what I mean? All the times that your kids spend with you, you're right. You know, my, I I knew my dad had confidence in me that I was gonna, you know, get better from this. It wasn't necessarily just that moment. I knew from past experience that he thought I was really good, what I do. And, but that moment was really, you know, the expression of that. That's cool. That's cool. So what's next for DeYoung Studios and, and beyond? What's next? Well, we head back up north here in the next couple of weeks, and I'm excited for that. And I've got a, quite a bit of... Um, trout artwork that I'm going to be doing. So it'll be good to change gears, change palettes, be reaching for warmer colors. Yeah. Yeah. Get up there and, and watch spring set in up north. Yeah. That's cool. And uh, that's when you say change palettes and stuff like that, that's another thing that I've kind of really has intrigued me about you is the ability to, to, uh, or I don't know if it's ability, you tell me what it is, but you're, you're often working in, in different types of art. Why is that? Or how is that? It's pure boredom. <laughs> my, my mind gets so bored doing the same thing over that I have to try it new ways or try new styles. Or if I see something that inspires me to try to, you know, work that into what I'm doing as a fish artist, that's just kind of my personality. Mm-hmm. But, I love the the pour. We went we went to uh, to Derek's studio this morning and <clears throat> did an interview with him, and then he showed us these these acrylic pours that you're doing, and um, that was super interesting. I've never seen anything like that before. Well, they're they're getting super popular, and I saw one on Instagram I think last fall, and I just thought, you know what? When we get down to Florida, I'm going to order all the stuff to do it, and I'm going to play with this, and um, it's been so much fun and you know, it's a slow learning curve because you, you add a little too much of this and, um, and it doesn't turn out or you put too much paint and it cracks or this or that happens. But what's been fun too, is all the people who have come down and hung out with us. Um, I do a pour with them and just to see how much joy they get. From yeah. It. Cause you know, I do art every day and I'm just so used to it. Most people do not. 
So, right. So to let them choose colors and let them, you know, tilt the canvas and get it right and flick the silicone on it. What do you think it is about about art and and being creative? For for some, when you see somebody that doesn't have that in their life, I, and you see I that joy it, that it gives it, them, what do you think the, it is? It brings the best out of them. I mean, you it, think it, it just there's something so satisfying about it, and usually they're instantly thinking, oh, oh, I'm going to get this stuff. I, I'm going to do this. I'm going to try it on my cabinet doors. I'm going to do this. I'm going to mm-hmm. do a whole wall of little panels of this. And, you know, whether they do or they don't, it's cool to watch their mind kind of take hold on it. Yeah. And then I think really when you have the, when you have the outlet for, uh, for creativity is when you do have all that stuff and then you have some time to get down there and you're not necessarily just over their shoulder all the time. You, they're they're able to play with it themselves and with failure and and yeah. success, right? Like that's <laughs> well, Janelle was trying it with doing some pours with me, and you know she just doesn't spend as much time kind of honing the skills to do it, and she's getting mad that hers weren't turning out. So she's, I don't need to do them anymore. I'm done with them. So <laughs> that we get to that point too, I guess, but. You know, well, it's all supposed to be fun though, right? Yeah. 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 And then you get that, you get that creativity. You satisfy that in some way. And lots of people have other ways of, of satisfying it. It may not be an artist. Right. Maybe you're a fishing guide and your art is, fly is, time. uh, yeah, fly time. Of course, that's, that's, that's something, but there could also be the art of, of being able to take somebody out in the boat and show them a great time and, and, and teach them things in a way that they weren't expecting and they come away from the day, you know, with a, with a greater understanding of the environment that they're in and the fish that they're looking for and the things that they eat and the birds that inhabit the whole, the whole deal. I don't know. I mean, that in itself is kind of a, is, is kind of an amazing gift to give somebody, you know, as a guide. And when you look at it that way, not just a job, but to have an opportunity, you know, to affect people, I think that's, really cool and that i think that there's i'm sure there's lots of guides out there like that but oh there are i mean they're guides just like they're artists there are guides you know there are artists that are at the top of their at their craft like yourself and you're you're doing everything and you're working every single day all day long to get better and to grow as an artist and and there are those fishing guides out there that are every single day they're writing in their journal and doing everything they possibly can to get better and you know, it's cloudy today or the wind was blowing in this direction and they just had no idea what to do. Well, they're going to fix that because the next time it's cloudy and, and blowing in this direction, they're not going to sit at home. They're going to actually be out there. That's the day they're looking yeah. forward to. So they can figure out how to fish on a north Try wind or on a out. south wind or sure. east wind or west wind or whatever it is. Because honestly, the conditions are not good most of the time. But right. but But people, you know, that's when someone takes whatever they're doing to an art form is, is when they're working on it all the time and, uh, and getting, getting better and better each time. And it's really great when, when that's all to help someone else do something, uh, whatever your profession is. I mean, fishing guide's easy because you're, you're trying to help people to have a, have a good time, but, but your artwork is, is super cool, man. And I, I really look forward to, um, to what you have going on and, uh, (laughs) If, uh, if you're hearing the, what sounds like a road, it is, we're actually doing this podcast in a car. <laughs> it's the first one ever in a car. Derek's actually right, doing hand it. signals on, on which way I should turn to get to his house. I um, did, didn't have to give you any directions. No, no, I'm doing so I'm doing pretty good right now, but this is where you get lost right up in here. I think this is the one. Okay. Well, cool. Well, I want to thank you for, um, for, doing this with us, both the, the television show and then doing the first podcast in a car. It was a, a first for me and it was so much fun. I really appreciated well, you having me. We're going to do it again, man. You're a great guest. You've got a great story. You love to fish. And one of the things that I have uh, really enjoyed about your artwork is the Barracuda. And um, I think that you just you nail a, it. a fellow... Uh, Barracuda yeah, lover. I, I love Barracuda. <laughs> dude, if it swims and you can catch it, I'm in. But I love the Barracuda. And and in Key West in the wintertime, that was a that was our, you know, that was our fish. I mean, we we went out and we caught Barracudas. These guys up here in the upper keys, they could go and redfish and snook fish and stuff like that. 
when it got cold, we, we fished for barracudas and yeah. some of the greatest days that, that I can ever remember were, were associated with barracudas and I, I just love them. And, and I've, I've taken my dad out for instance and put him on a tarpon and then we caught a couple of kudas and we got back in and he's like, I think I, I liked the kudas better. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're super fast. They're, they they, they have an amazing bite and I don't know, you can catch a lot of them in a day sometimes. And then when, when you right. pick them up, they are just nasty looking and cool looking and just, uh, I don't know, but very few people that I've seen can really nail, nail the Barracuda as an artist. Yeah. And, uh, I, I think that, is this it? No. One more. I think that you, uh, you've got it with a, with a number of your, of your pieces. <laughs> well, and, uh, so I, appreciate so I want to go Cuda fishing with you. We'll, we'll do another show. Is this it? Yep. We'll do another show. I'd like that. Let's next go out year. to the Marquesas and, uh, yeah, that's great because chase them in the winter. that is, uh, that is really an area that I have spent a lot of time and like that area. We did a show with Mike Pollock last year where we, uh, where we, uh, went out there and did nothing but barracuda fish. And really it's a, it's a great place because the water's just so clear and nice, just like you have here in big pine, but there, there's some big ones that, yeah, there's that come some in there. monsters that live out there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll do it and we'll make, we'll make it happen. And I think Thanks again for doing this podcast and sticking with us when the fishing wasn't, wasn't oh, good. Hey, you're, I'm out here all the time. I don't catch fish every day. You're so. the real deal, man. Thank <laughs> you. I appreciate it, Derek. Absolutely. Uh, hey, if Thanks, anybody Tom. wants to, uh, if anybody wants to go find your stuff, tell them how they can get a hold of you. Uh, my website is just my name. It's Derek D com. D E R E O U N G. Yep. D E R E K D E Y O U N G. Okay. That's where they can go and get, that's I'm looking at, at your, I'm looking at your, your, your truck wrap with a, the with back a trout. of my pickup truck. Yep. It's got a big brown trout face on it. You can buy all that stuff there, huh? Oh yeah. It's all, all on right. the site. Cool. All right, man. Thanks, right. Derek. See you. Thanks, Tom. Hey everybody. Thank you so much for listening to the show. I hope you got something out of that. Got just a little bit of news. We have started a weekly show that is designed to be up to the minute videos of what's happening this week mostly in the Florida Keys, but also in other places that we fish as well. We'll be putting that out every week. And the best way to find that is to subscribe to the YouTube channel, YouTube slash Saltwater Experience. Search Saltwater Experience on YouTube, subscribe to that channel, and you will get updates of when a new video is published. I've also figured out how to put the podcast on YouTube, finally. A lot of people like to put that window behind other things they're working on and listen to the podcast while they are working. So we now have that for you. And there is a playlist called podcast. There's a playlist called weekly show. You can go and see all the new videos that we're putting up there. Started a new email address specifically for this show. And that is podcast at saltwaterexperience.com podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. Those emails come directly to me. I'll see every single one of them. So if you have comments, suggestions, ways we can make the show better, and particularly if you have suggestions of someone you would like to see me sit down with in the hunting world, in the fishing world, in the outdoor sports world, or just a motivation, inspirational character, or someone that can teach us all something. I'm very interested in your suggestions. So that's podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. You can get the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, SoundCloud, and we're also publishing it on the blog the weekly show will be published on the blog too, but the best way is to go to YouTube, subscribe there, and you'll get it immediately when it's published. So until next week, thanks for listening. And we'll see you soon.